Richard's been around in the industry for probably seven or eight years. I suspect probably seven or eight years. We've, we've known Richard from the very early days. I think we loved Richard at the beginning. We fell out of love with him in the middle. And we've fallen in love with him again, which is nice. <laughs> Let's see how the next 30 minutes progresses. Yeah. So um, that's over a period of time. And we thought it would be a good idea to interview him. Now, Richard, we're going to talk about in a little bit here. Richard, we, we describe Richard as the most networked man in our industry. There he is with the new mayor. Was he the mayor when you met him? No. He wasn't the mayor. I knew him point. before he was famous. Oh, yeah, right. And is he, are you really tall or is he just very, very small? I was on stilts. Ah. Uh, and you got your hat on? Same hat. Yeah, okay. So, unless it's somebody I know. See, when I hit 30, I put it forwards. Okay. Yeah, and a little bit of chest hair there as well. It's a bit <coughs> scary. Luckily, we don't, we're not modeling that look today. That's obviously Prince Andrew. Oh, look, somebody even more famous. Yeah. So, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we went to visit Richard. Um, I'll let Richard explain what he does in a second. We went to visit you in your new R&D facility in uh, East London, I guess. Yeah. So, in one minute, because I'm going to stop you if you go too long, explain to the audience what you do. Okay, so I'm Richard Corbett. I'm the founder and CEO of ITs. Uh, if you've ever seen screens on the roof of taxis that are working, that's us. Um, so, I invented the product six and a half years ago. I went to New York. Um, oh, I'll say that again. Say so that bit again, go back. I invented the product six and a half years ago. No, no, the bit before that. Oh, that works. Yeah. Yeah, it works. Um, <laughs> thanks, Dirk. Are we still doing dinner on Thursday? Yeah. Sweet, thanks. Oh, he's paying now. <laughs> so, um, so six and a half years ago, I went to New York, saw strip club adverts and family areas and family brands and strip club areas, and it was all wrong. Uh, I thought that the power of digital signage, we can actually marry, um, you know, the, the right message at the right place, right time, on a format that is always near to high volumes of people. So embarked on that trip. I was 24 years old. It was the height of the recession. I lost my job. Uh, no one would employ me, so I employed myself. Um, and I found this concept that I really believed in passionately. And uh, with no understanding of technology, media, transport, any of the prerequisites to be successful in this sector, um, I thought, there's nothing holding me back. Let's do it. And um, four and a half years later, we changed laws in London with Transport for London, and we uh, sold a multi-million dollar deal with the world's largest media company within the space. And now you can see hundreds running around London today. Well, and this is, so when we first met Richard, because we're big mini fans as well at Daily Do, uh, <laughs> when we first met him, you drove this at Screen Media Expo. Those of you who remember Screen Media Expo, hasn't been around for quite a few years now. Uh, Actually, Dirk was the first guy that ever saw it. Was he? Yeah. Oh, wow. We went somewhere in, was it uh, Paddington? Uh, had a little coffee. We saw there. the Mini. So we, were, we fell in love with the Mini and the little mobile time. And we remember the time that you drove that to Amsterdam. Yes. Overtook us, got caught speeding. <laughs> that's an early version of the product, I believe. Yeah. That's right. Slightly different to the one that's now. So, Verified Media, of course, you're a big client here in London at the moment. And this is some campaigns. There's been lots of campaigns. They did the, they're doing the Starbucks Frappuccino campaign, which is, guess what, it's hot and nice. And it's Frappuccino week or something. I don't get any offers, though. No, I don't. you don't. No, neither They've don't. forgotten about me now. So that's the first product. But when you started off, you wanted to be a media owner. And this is the thing yeah. I want to talk about. So we've had a, you know, a lot of people who come to the, uh, the Media Summit and the event that we do in New York are entrepreneurs or want to be entrepreneurs like Richard is. So they have an idea, uh, and they think, I can build a media company, or I can build a technology company. I, you freely admitted how difficult it has been for you. But the secret to your success now is the fact that you pivoted. You changed what you were doing. So... You didn't find media very easy, so you no. become a technology company. Do you want to just explain that? A yeah, little? sure. I mean, when I started, I was completely naive to the intricacies and difficulties to create the technology, be a media owner, um, get approval with Transport for London. All of it was, you know, and actually the oversimplistic view on the world actually was pretty good and focusing on if I can make it happen, the value proposition is so strong that it's got to work. So it was that passion and blind kind of naivety to the, the challenge at hand that kept me going. But... I guess we pivoted because actually when you start a business, you've almost got to run everything in parallel. You cannot say no to any strategy. Although that sounds like you're trying to do everything, you're actually trying to run multiple different strategies because inevitably one of them will um, hit a roadblock. Um, so I wanted to be the media owner. No one was doing the technology. So I thought if we could marry this digital technology that could be updated wirelessly, changed by GPS to change each street with relevant targeted media content, then we would have the most powerful media format in the world, theoretically. Um, and so we weren't shackled to a, a fixed site. So we could roam wherever there's a street we could advertise. Um, I soon found out that you cannot be all things to all people. You have to focus on what you do best. And 
you know, Bill Gates said you've got to do your 10,000 hours. I've pretty much done hundreds of thousands of those now. So we've built a, a, an expertise and, 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 a, and, a, and a core competency in disruptive technology. And um, I realized that you can't design, make, warrant the technology, then sell the advertising. You're talking to different clients. You're talking, there's different conversations, different skill sets. And so very quickly, I started to say, you know what, I'm just going to focus on what I do best, the tech, and then let someone else do the rest. And, uh, you know, we were fortunate enough to, to work with Verifone. What I loved about Verifone was that they're this big American company that's so pro trying new things. And one of the struggles I had in the UK was actually trying to get um, bigger companies to try a relatively unproven entity's product. Um, because there's an element of risk. But what I love about the Americans is that their society, their culture, their economy is all built around trying new ideas and embracing um, the, 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 the unproven entity. And, you know, you look at the Fortune 500, half the companies didn't exist 20 years ago. You look at the FTSE 100, pretty much all of them were there 20 years ago. It's very, very different. Um, so they know that growth comes from startups and entrepreneurs, and that takes a little bit of risk. Uh, but calculated risk. So, you know, we had four and a half years to be able to get there before Verifone said, we believe in it. And that was all based around the TFL process. So, you know, TFL had never done this before. So, you know, all credit to them. They, you know, they're trying to be the jack of all trades. They're approving lots of different technologies and having them to immerse themselves in each one. And so we work with them to define the process and, and, and the steps and tests required. And within that time, actually, inadvertently, we created an even better product because, you know, you saw the mini, then you saw the first version, then the mass production. You know, it's a completely different world from where, you know, uh, where we were on the Mini Cooper with when I saw, showed Dirk in early 2010. Okay. So, you know, so we had to pivot because we realized that we weren't going to succeed if we did everything. Okay. Now, you see, this is some of the early stuff uh, that you did. When These you are my hand sketches from Hand sketches and stuff. We love, we, love, we love heritage, so we love all the early sketches. Uh, Richard supplies with all sorts of things that you've done in the early days and the shows that you went to, and he spent a lot of time networking, going to the right shows, um, and whatever. This was December 2009, just lost my job, trying to create a new product. Um, everyone asked me, how do you come up with ITs? And they're like, is it a play on words on IT? I was like, well, that makes more sense, doesn't right. it? Right. Um, but actually, the real reason was I lived opposite a strip tease club, and um, I thought, that sounds pretty cool. Um, would I do the same brand today? Probably not. Um, but, you know, we built such a strong brand equity and reputation that we can't change it now. But, no. uh, I would like you, it. Um, I mean... Would, if, you were, if you had your time again, would you do another business in out of home or digital out of home? I think it's an exciting space. I think we are at the center of, the, and I hate using it, you know, smart cities. You know, we have a gift of an opportunity to navigate the public um, through their, their journey. And, um, you know, we, we can't fight the fact the most important screen in, a, in the public's life is in their pocket. But So if we embrace that concept and say, well, we can be the prompt, that relevant targeted prompt that makes that person uh, live a better life, make a smarter d decision, then, then that's how we can work together. And, and I think what we've got right now and what we work with, and the things that we're doing with Verifone right now is seeing how that we can take that further, how we can push that further because we've, we're going to be near to where high volumes of people are. That's what taxis do. So, so how can we leverage that to make their life, add value to their life? We can't just spam them. We need to think about how we can tangibly add value to their journey. So would I do it again? Definitely. I mean, I was thinking about this this morning when you, you asked the question, um, you know, would I have done it again? Would I do this all over again if I knew how difficult it would be? And, you know, it's a difficult question because we probably chose one of the most difficult products to develop, but also the most highly regulated market to put digital signage on. So, you know, I was, I was in the Guardian newspaper uh, before we got approval with TFL saying it's easier to strap a screen on the Queen of England than it is to put one on the London taxi. It's because we're dealing with an iconic shape and we're dealing with an icon. The Queen so, or the taxi? Oh. Well, yeah, the Queen's next. Actually, I met Prince Andrew the day after that and that was really awkward. But, you know, the, the point I was trying to make is that we went into a market that was so difficult to attach technology to that, that you know, would I do it again? I don't know. I mean, I, I believe in the product so, so strongly that I think I probably would. Mm -hmm. um, did I think it would take that long? No. Right. Um, but there's um, so many opportunities in the outdoor market, and one of the things we're doing with our new R&D facility is actually accelerating new product development. So we're working with you know, half of the large companies in here as an extension of their technology arm. So we want to say, we're excellent at technology, you're excellent at media. Let's work together, and that's what we're doing with a lot of companies in here. But down to yeah. client confidentiality, which is the thing you hate from me saying that. It is, yeah. You can't say anything. <laughs> Well, we were hoping that uh, your R&D facility was going to be open this week, and we are going to do an open house, but we came to see you a couple of weeks ago, and it 
wasn't quite ready, but that's something... It's all getting done. renovated, yeah, in the next couple of weeks. Now, I'm quoting you here, so don't beat me up. We're far enough apart that you can't... <laughs> you can throw things at me. Oh, God, what's But this? you once said that you were funded by friends, family, and fools. Oh, yeah. Well, I didn't put any money in, so that <laughs> kills the last one. But You're so, not family um, quite yet. Well, well, you know what I said to someone the other day? We're like a married couple, except we don't thing. sleep together. And then someone said to me, you're exactly like a married couple. <laughs> so, Very good. Yeah. So um, have you got advice to people about the investment side of things? There are a few, uh, entre- well, the, I'm, I'm sure you're all entrepreneurs, but there are a few startups and people yeah. in, this, in the room. And it's a question we're always asking when we do an investor conference in New York. Is there advice to anybody in the room here about how you get money and how you start off? Because... Well, you always look for the cheapest cost of capital, and uh, the cheapest cost of capital, although you don't like it, is the three Fs, friends, family, and fools. Now, I said that on CNBC, and then you ripped the piss out of me. I did. So, I, and I probably deserved it. Um, but it was, it's, it's a kind of known phrase in, in the startup arena where, you know, someone's giving you money but not getting equity. So, you know, who's the fool? But actually, you know, the cheapest cost of capital is the three Fs, and if you can, you know, I mean, there's a pecking order of, you know, when you're, when you're fundraising, you go for the cheapest cost of capital all the way to uh, bank debt uh, at the very end. So, uh, you know, and that has the most teeth, that has the least. Um, I actually found that the three Fs was the, um, the most motivating um, way to fund, fundraise. Um, my parents retired. I mean, I earned more than my dad when I was 22. And so he was not a rich man. So when I borrowed money from them to pursue my entrepreneurial dream, um, every time I hit a challenge, I... I it, I couldn't stop because I was, I was affecting their lives, I was affecting their retirement, and so I just couldn't stop. I was already so deep into this, no matter how big the challenge was, I had to find a way around it. And um, so that for me was possibly the most stressful way to fundraise, but also the most motivating. That kept me going the whole way. Um, but you know, you've got the full spectrum. I mean, now you've got crowdfunding, you can, you can crowdfund debt or raise equity, you can do seed, angel, VC, private equity, or the whole spectrum, depending on where you are and the growth of your business. I mean, there's so many choices out there. Um, bank loans, completely useless if, if you're running a, to creating a startup. I and mean, we looked at, well, I did look into it at one point. And, um, you know, you need collateral, and no startup has collateral. So, and then, then there's government back loans mm-hmm. and all of that rubbish. And actually, the bank's still the bottleneck, even though the government is giving you a, uh, the, the bank uh, a risk-free client because they're guaranteeing the full amount. Um, they still don't want to move forward unless you have collateral. So it, when you're a startup, you don't actually have all of those yeah. options. So you do have to find all the different... Um, creative ways to get the funding. Is there, so what's the, what's the one thing that the digital signage and digital home world can look forward to getting from ITs, both in the UK, and I know you have some international plans abroad, for the rest of the year? So, I mean, we talk a lot about the iTaxi top, but we also have, um, we created the world's first in-vehicle Wi-Fi system back in 2011, and so we have hundreds of taxis with that now. We're looking at ways that we can develop that in different transit markets. Um, the investment in the R&D facility is my uh, way of trying to put my money where my mouth is and stop preaching innovation and, and, and all that stuff without actually investing in engineering stuff, R&D, creating new products. You know, we're about, th- our tagline now is Think, Create, Disrupt. We're not about looking at what else everyone else is doing and trying to replicate it cheaper. We're trying to find that problem that we can productize the solution to. And so we're trying to disrupt markets. And so uh, what you can expect from us, a combination of working with some of the players in here on developing new disruptive tech, but also developing our own stuff. We're actually looking to move part of the business into IoT. And um, it's really funny, when I set up the, the business six years ago, everyone said hardware. You know, isn't that what Asia does? And I said, no, you know, we can do it too, you know, we, we, but we're not cost effective. But that's not true. Germany, Japan do quite well mm-hmm. in that space. It's about processes and management styles. We need to just raise our game as a country. And I'm very passionate about doing that and bringing manufacturing back here. We do everything in Bedford and Stevenage, mm-hmm. rock and roll. You know, we do it here, not in Southeast Asia. We keep an eye on quality and control. We do all the new product development, R&D side, all locally. So, you know, you're going to start to see um, some products in the consumer space as well as in the B2B space. Wow. Okay. Good. Richard, we're going to lead on to TFL. That's a segue. So we plan these things. Richard, thank you very much. Thank you.